Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tom Hoxter. I'm an adjunct history instructor here at Carroll Community College, and I'll be your host tonight. Uh, tonight, we are here to listen to a presentation by a Holocaust survivor. Also, before uh, we get into the program, to let you know that we are filming for a later television presentation of this program. So uh, just to let you know, their cameras are on, so you may you know, get up or something in front of one of them just to let you know that that's going to be taking place, okay? Just, just behave yourself. Right, just behave yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I welcome you all on behalf of uh, you know, Carroll Community College. Uh, we're excited that you all decided to come tonight to hear Leo. Leo is... Uh, I call him Leo because I've, I've known him for 17 years. Because um, that's my so name. Please, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's my name. name. Right. Yes, please don't, uh, you know, think that I'm not uh, giving him his due, you know, by not calling him Mr. Breathos. But uh, we've known each other for 17 years, so it's, you know, on a first name basis, and uh, you know, it's all right. Holocaust. When you think of Holocaust, what do you think of? You think of going to a concentration camp and surviving a concentration camp. Okay, that's true. Many of the uh, Holocaust survivors are people who went to concentration camps and survived concentration camps. Uh, Leo did not go to one of the major concentration camps. Okay. Death, what, death camps? Right, the death camps. He was on the run for seven years. Okay, he was on the run for seven years. And one of my students in my Hitler and Third Reich class pointed out, he said that one of those years before the war even started, I said, that's true because he was in Austria when Hitler came in. And then a few months later, he was on the run. And he will be running for seven years. And I mean, I just think about that, running for seven years, uh, not knowing what's gonna happen to you. And my question always has been to Leo is, why didn't you give up? Why didn't you just say, I had enough? You know, when's enough? Because you don't know that I only have to run for seven years. You didn't know that. Could have been 9, 10, 12. Didn't know that. And here he's captured five times. Okay, he's captured five times. But he's able to escape five times. And the last time is the title of his book, A Leap Into Darkness. Okay, Leo is one of the few people who have ever jumped from a train. The train had a thousand people heading to Auschwitz. Okay, Leo and another young man, Manfred, pulled the bars apart on the train. He will tell you in more detail about this. They jumped off the train and survived. The other 998 people were all gassed at Auschwitz. How does Leo know this? His name's in the book of the people who died at Auschwitz. I give you Leo Bretholtz. Holocaust survivor, author of Leap into Darkness, international speaker, you're on. I'm done. Can you all hear me? Yes? Thank you, Tom, for that gracious introduction, I really have to live up to something now and satisfy you. And I uh, try to do my best this evening. And before I begin, I'd just like to wish my friend Tom and his wife, Tijuana, a happy anniversary. It's the anniversary today. It's not an April Fool joke, it's true. <laughs> Tom and Tijuana, Many more years together in joy and love and happiness. As Tom just introduced me as a survivor, I would like for you to know that I don't really exult in that term because that makes me be somebody special. And I want you to know right from the beginning that this whole audience here, you are all survivors. Because what happened during those years that I will tell you about 
if that evil that ruled Europe at the time had won what they were setting out to win, if they had won this war, we would not be sitting here talking to each other. We are all survivors, please. And those of you who are in your 18s and 19s and 20s, or younger people, I want to please indulge me and be with me step by step as I'm telling you my story. Because you will be able to relate to it. My story began when I was 17. And therefore, if you can be by my side as I tell the story, what would you have done? How would you have acted or reacted? And then when Tom spoke, he said, somebody said, well, seven years on the run, the war only didn't last that long. Well, there was a book written called The, the War Against the Jews by Lucy Davidovich. Some of you may have read it. The War Against the Jews. Well, the war against the Jews actually began in 1933. In fact, today in the paper, I read the, uh, the uh, Carroll County Times there in the lobby before, it says, today is the day, April the 1st, where in 1933, Hitler decreed that you should boycott stores that were owned by Jews. So the war began right then and there. It began with a boycott, and it ended with murder. <coughs> the term Holocaust did not appear on the scene until the, after the liberation of Auschwitz. Auschwitz was liberated in January of 1945. And when the troops entered, the liberators entered, and their eyes were witnessing the horror, they had a hard time finding a term for what they had just witnessed. Nothing in history had happened before. Churchill called it a crime without a name. A journalist from the London Times who accompanied the troops was supposed to report to his editor about the liberation of the camps. And he called his editor on the phone. He says, I'm here, he said on the telephone. I'm here to report of what we have just liberated and found but I will it take a while for me to send you this report because I cannot find the right words for it. And then they went to the dictionaries and to encyclopedias to try to find a term that would define the scene they had just witnessed. They came to the Greek encyclopedia or dictionary and found the term Holocauston. It's Holocaust with an O N at the end. It's a Greek noun. Holocauston, which translates as total destruction by burning. That was the description. We have a term in English that refers to that caustic. When something is caustic, it's a burning matter. So this term Holocauston has gone into the English language, and it's now established as the term for what happened in the 1940s. And when I speak to you, to some of your youngsters, this may seem like ancient history, like 70 years ago or so. To me, it's all still very vividly in my mind. In fact, it is still current history because hatred is still with us. In the 1970s, a book was written by a Jesuit priest by the name of Edward H. Flannery. Maybe you've had a chance to read it. If not, you can make some notes. It's a very important volume. Edward H. Flannery wrote this book titled The Anguish of the Jews. And in this, and I'm paraphrasing, in this he says to say that Hitler's persecution of the Jews and his attempt to annihilate them 
is the most horrifying event in the annals of Jewish history is an understatement. It is the most horrifying event in the totality of world history. Nothing like this had ever happened again. And then I'm, quote, I'm going to quote Professor Raoul Hilberg, passed away two years ago. Raoul Hilberg told you this. And this points to the fact that Hitler was not the beginning of it. He was the culmination of what had happened for 23 centuries. And the historian Raoul Hilberg puts it this way, in very succinct terms. The early missionaries told the Jews of Europe, you may not live among us as Jews. So the Jews, in order to be able to live among them, many of them converted. Later, the secular Christian said a shorter sentence. You may not live among us. So they were not allowed to live among them. They went into ghettos and separated from the rest of the population. The first ghetto, ghetto is an Italian term. The first ghetto was established in Venice. And then in the 1930s came Hitler. And he made it a very short sentence. You may not live, period. I just quoted Professor Hilberg. These are not my words. And to tell you how I came to be involved in that is my personal story. How many of you have been at the Holocaust Museum? Oh, I see hands full. You may have read other books. You have read, uh, how many of you have already read Leap into Darkness? Thank you. And you may have had Anne Frank's story, Anne Frank's diary, and uh, Night by Elie Wiesel, and other prominent authors. The Holocaust Museum is, the, the, the work of the Holocaust Museum is basically two-faceted. Number one, remembrance. Remembrance is very important because we have to remember the victims. If we do not remember them, we kill them a second time. Hitler said he wants us to disappear. Now, if we do not remember the victims, we are giving Hitler a posthumous victory and we cannot allow this. And then the very important aspect, perhaps more important, is education. And this is what this is all about, education. Now, for those of you who have seen the Holocaust Museum, you see this cattle train there. It was pointed out by Tom before that I escaped from one of those trains, and I'll explain later. But the train that you have seen, that cattle car that you have seen in the museum, it would have been impossible for me and my friend to escape from. The bars in these two windows that are diagonally across in that cattle car, the bars in that car were bolted to the outside wall of the car. Our bars were in the frame, so they were easier to dislodge rusty bars, and so on. Another thing I want you to know right away, because it's emotional to me, I don't know the resting place of my mother and sisters, and I will never know. It is a real luxury to know where your parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, family, have their rest, their last resting places. If it's far away, even if you never get there to visit it, but the knowledge that it is there is comforting. I will never know that about my mother and sisters. But when I go to that museum and I walk by that pile of shoes, allow me and permit me to be a little emotional about this. When I walk by this pile of shoes, I stand there for a moment in thought and meditation, and sometimes I'm with students and they join me, because by the slightest chance, one in a million, perhaps one of those shoes belong to my mother or sisters. That's my point of reference. And with this, I'm going to tell you my story. 
Tom will keep time. Isn't that right, Tom? You're going to keep time. How did I get involved in this? Two facets. I was born in Vienna, Austria, and I had committed the great crime of being born into a Jewish family. In 1938, as you know from history, the Germans entered Austria, took over the country, annexed it to Greater Germany. It was called in German the Anschluss, which means annexation. Any of you speak a little German or French? I better stick to English then. <laughs> the, Aust the Germans took over Austria. I lived then in Vienna. And overnight, overnight our existence as Jewish families descended into utter chaos. Restrictions, arrests, people being sent away, never to be heard from again. The first victims singled out by the Germans or the Austrians who were now with the Germans. But you know, the Austrians say they were, the, they were the first victims, but don't believe that because I remember them receiving the Germans with flowers and church bells all over the place. They were not the first victims. And they acted viciously, so much so that the Germans said, they're giving us an example how to really do it. And overnight, we didn't, we had chaos. At that time, I was 17, I had two younger sisters, 16 and 10. My mother was a widow. She had become a widow in 1930, eight years earlier, at age 35, when I was nine. I lost my father when I was nine. My father died at age 39, so it wasn't easy for us as a family, but my mother managed. And when the first victim singled out, we are males, Jewish males, 16 to 60, to be sent away, never to be heard from again, from time to time, packages would arrive at their homes, at their residence, for which they had to sign and pay for. The packages contained ashes. This happened around us with friends, relatives, acquaintances. My mother said to me, Leo, you are not safe here. This is no place for you. You have to leave. You could be next. But when you're 17 and you have two younger sisters and the mother is a widow, you have become, I've become the, the father image to my younger sisters helping my mother. And you know very well how it is. And you all live in family situations. Siblings, parents, grandparents, great-grandparents. So you can understand this. I resisted the thought that my mother wanted me to leave. I said, how about you and the girls? She says, I have to manage, but you are in danger. Now, when your mother tells you something, she means it, right? So I knew she meant it. And no matter how much I protested, it didn't work. Leo, you have to leave. And it was decided that I would go to Luxembourg. Any geographers here? Gia Luxembourg is that small country wedged between Germany, France, and Belgium. Population 300,000 or something like that. And it was decided that I would go to Luxembourg <coughs> and I have to cross a river into Luxembourg. To say goodbye to my family and again, be by my side, and imagine what that means to say goodbye to a mother and two younger sisters. My younger sister, 10, was then at the hospital. She had been taken to the hospital a few days earlier with scarlet fever, which at that time was a contagious disease, healed now and everything. Scarlet fever, and she was in quarantine in a room separated from the rest of the population. There was no way for me to say goodbye to her, being near her, and hug her. Very tender moment. My mother and I and my middle sister went to the hospital to say goodbye 
to my youngest sister, then 10 years old. For those of you who have read the book, you know all those details. We stood in the courtyard of the hospital, looking at the mezzanine window, and there was my little sister, 10 years old. Brown hair, brown eyes, curly hair. I said in the book, she looked at that moment like, to me, like the last angel on earth. But there she was, a blackboard in her left hand and a piece of chalk in her right. And I motioned to her in sign language. I will be leaving, because that was discussed at home for many weeks. Well, leaving, goodbye. And she wrote on the blackboard, see you soon again, good luck. I want you to know that was the last time that I saw my sister. And then we walked home on a rainy October evening, my mother and my other sister and I, and I said goodbye to my mother and my other sister. And again, see you soon again, that's what my mother said. And then her last words were, the last words that she spoke to me. Never forget who you are. I live by that. Long ago, that was 1938, that's now 71 years ago, and I remember it vividly. Now you know, some of you say, how old is this guy? Huh? No secret. It's no secret, right? I take it a day at a time, okay? I was just 88. Of course, my mother and sisters never reached any age. In 1942, they were deported to a death camp. But when we said goodbye in 1938, see you soon again, we really meant it. We meant it because this cannot last forever. How long can this last? And keep that in mind throughout my talk. This was the 20th century. The nation of poets and thinkers, philosophers, the nation of Brahms and Beethoven and Bach and Nietzsche and Schopenhauer and Kant. This was no backward society, 20th century. So naturally, we said, this was our mantra, see you soon again. Never happened. I left Vienna and crossed into Luxembourg through a river, the River Sauer, S-A-U-E-R. If you ever invest in Germany or invest in Europe, look up that river. It's actually a, a narrow mountain stream, something like from here to maybe the end of the road, the row here. A mountain stream, which I was told by correspondence I will be able to ford up to my knees, and there was a, there's going to be a, a guide there, you know. I don't like to call him guide, Mr. Becker. You know what I call, call, call him? I call him a smuggler. It's more adventurous, isn't it? Sounds, <laughs> sounds more adventurous. He was a smuggler. Of course he had to smuggle me across. He was a Luxembourger. He could cross the border legally back and forth, but I had to be smuggled. Now this creek was no longer a mountain creek. It had rained for five days and five nights in succession, and it became a torrent. For those five days and five nights, mind you, this is interesting, I was sheltered in a monastery of Franciscan friars. This was arranged by a Jewish committee called Ezra, E-Z-R-A. Ezra, translated in, from Hebrew into English, means help. This committee arranged for me to be sheltered with the Franciscan friars. And then when Mr. Becker came into Germany, the town of Trier, T-R-I-E-R, -E Western Germany, <coughs> he picked me up and took me to the river. And then he said to me, do you know how to swim? He asked me. I said, yes. Well, 
says, I, I'm going to walk through the river. No, I just want to know. You know what? He knew what it was. He knew this river was not what it was described to me as being after the five nights and five days of rain. He thought I'll get cold feet and won't want to do it, and then he doesn't get paid for taking me across. Whatever it is, he has, his job is to bring me across. So he said to me, in your suit, in your little satchel that you carry, do you have some dry socks, a change of socks? I said, sure, I have some socks and underwear and whatever. He says, well, why don't you take these dry socks and put them into your overcoat? I was fully dressed. Any of you remember knickers? No. I, knickerbockers, I, it's knickers. I wore the knickers and a gabardine top coat, and that's the way I went through the river. But he says, take those dry socks out of your satchel, put them into your coat pocket, and then when you cross, you'll have dry socks and change your socks because you can catch a cold with those wet socks, you know. Well, he took me to the river, he says, I'll wait for you on the other side, and I will be, it was between 11 and at night and midnight. He says, I'll be on the other side, cruising back and forth with my lights blinking on and off so that you know it's my car. You shouldn't approach a car that could put you in danger, police or anybody else. Well, I listened to him, did as he instructed me, and he took me to the embankment, said, see you on the other side, and I stepped into that river, and the first step I took, I was up to here in water. <laughs> here go my dry socks. <laughs> now I had two pair of wet socks, the ones in my pocket <laughs> on my feet. I hoped that Becca would have another spare pair of socks, but no. I managed the river to get across. I really didn't have to make any movements. The current carried me. And I had this little satchel, and I threw it ahead and grabbed it and threw it ahead and grabbed it. And this is the way I made my, my escape into Luxembourg. Nine days later, Mr. Becker took me and five other people in his car north to Belgium arranged by the same committee. We were in that car, and Becker was a, he was really a fellow who liked to make us, com feel, make us feel comfortable. He was a jokester. The situation was tense. There are some emotional moments, like saying goodbye, then the tense moments. There's so many different moments in my years of running, and I'll get to that. But the, the situation was tense, but Becker tried to make light of it. He tried to sort of joke around a little bit to make it easier on us. There was this one girl sitting on a woman, a German woman, and this young girl in, in, in her teens, and he drove pretty fast. She got sick and started vomiting. I tapped him on the shoulder, I said, Mr. Becker. I said, Herr Becker. She just threw up. He says, that's fine, now I knew I drove the right speed. <laughs> that was his way of joking. I knew I had the right speed. He had to go fast because he didn't want to work. It was a, a scene. We arrived in, in Brussels, Belgium. That same night. And we were lodged in a hotel. The next morning, the headlines in the French newspapers proclaimed, Nuit de terreur en Allemagne, programme contre les Juifs. A night of terror in Germany, a pogrom against the Jews. That was the night from November 9th to November 10th that I crossed into Belgium. It's been known as Crystal Night, Kristallnacht, or the night of the broken glass. You've heard on history about it. This was in 1938, November 1938, 71 years ago. When I saw that headline and read the article in my two-year high school knowledge of French, I read what had happened in Germany during that night. Over a thousand synagogues burned to the ground. Hundreds of department stores ransacked, people's furniture thrown out of their apartments, arrests, killings. I read this and I saw as I read the article that it happened in so many cities in Germany, in the world stood still. I got a paper from, I got a sun, 
a, a copy of the Sun paper from the library from November 1938. Just a footnote. In fact, Goebbels, the propaganda minister, said after the event the next day, today I would not want to be a Jew in Germany. And that's what happened during that night. And my thought immediately goes to my family. How did they make out during that night? And I found out only a few weeks later, it took me a while, that they had escaped unharmed during that night. I spent 18 months in Belgium. The committee assigned me to the city of Antwerp in Belgium. And I spent 18 months there, catching up with some distant family that an uncle of mine had found, and they were distant cousins of my mother from her hometown in Poland. So I spent a pleasant 18 months in Belgium, rather safe, but still worried about my family, naturally. And as you know from history, the Germans attacked Poland on September the 1st, 1939. May I point out something to you? It's trivial, but it shows a mindset. All the actions that Hitler took or most of them, important actions, took place on a Friday. His astrologer advised him that. Just tell you the mindset. Entered Vienna on Friday the 11th of March. Attacked Poland on Friday, September the 1st. Then here I am in Belgium for 18 months between that time when Poland was conquered and 19, May 1940. In May 1940, the Germans attacked Belgium and Holland, Luxembourg and France. On Friday, May the 10th, 1940. Now in the interim, there was a period that was called in French, La drôle de guerre, the funny war. The funny war, why? Because while Poland was conquered, and a day, two days after the Germans attacked Poland, the French and the British declared war on Germany on September the 3rd, but nothing was going on on the Western Front. It was called the funny war because the soldiers faced each other in no man's land, their guns were stacked, they played soccer together friendly enemies or something like that, but no action until May the 10th. That's when they attacked in force the West. The night before, Thursday the 9th, I entered the hospital in Antwerp, Belgium, to have a hernia repaired. I had a, developed a hernia, and it hurt, and it was bothersome. The doctor told me, you're young, you're 19, you don't want to run around with this and be handicapped. Get it. They don't call hernia operation. They call it repair because it's supposed to be a very small thing. It's like you repair shoes or something like that. <laughs> but I was now in the hospital on Thursday night to be operated on the next morning. The operation never took place. Because the next morning, the bombs fell over Antwerp, everywhere, the very famous zoo. The animals escaped and had to be gathered in again. The museum, the, the Rubens Museum, the, the cathedral, the harbor, which is very strategic, everything bombed in sight. Two bombs fell into the hospital ground, knocking out windows, incendiary bombs. Well, immediately, the civil defense appeared with their white helmets, instructing us, those of you who, are, who can walk under your own power, you're ambulatory, you're not operated, you're not bedridden, get your clothes, get dressed, come to the office, pick up your document, 
and we will tell you how to get home under the bombardment. We will instruct you. I listened as instructed, left the hospital, and my hernia was untouched. And I have to repeat that because that comes back to haunt me later and gives me one of the most elevating moments in my years of running. Keep it in mind. I left the hospital and went back to the place where I had my apartment, but there were placards all over the place for us. Enemy aliens, present yourselves at the police station. We who had come from Germany or Austria and became refugees in Belgium, and they accepted us, gave us temporary resi residence, uh, residential permits for 18 months. Belgium was, they were good to us. But now was war. Germany had attacked. And those of us who had come from that country that had just attacked are considered enemy aliens. They have no time to say, are you a spy or not? Are you with us or against us? They have to take it all as a group and then sort them out. There were 600 of us, 600 men arrested. And I said to the policeman, I'm not your enemy. Did I do something wrong? Commercial break. I have to take care of them. Got some stronger. <laughs> <laughs> Looks the same, but tastes differently. <laughs> Thank you. He treats me like a father. <laughs> Thank you, son. <laughs> we were arrested, and I said to the police, I am 19, I can fight with you. We are not your enemies. They were our enemies before they just became yours. That's why we were here. We ran away from them. They are our enemies. We are in this together. The law is the law. And 600 of us were put into a train, sealed train, not a cattle convoy, but passenger trains, but sealed. And we were taken down to southern France. It took five days to travel down under the war action. There were fights, air fights, you know, the Allies and the, and the Germans. The train had to come to a stop many, many times. And we were taken to a camp near the Spanish border. A camp in the Pyrenees Mountains. This camp was called Saint Cyprian. Saint Cyprian, C-Y-P-R-I-E-N. It's near the city of uh, uh, not Rivesal. Perpignan, near the city of Perpignan in southern France, southwest France. And this camp had been a, an internment camp for the Spanish refugees, the ones that come into France during the Spanish Civil War from 36 to 39. And this camp was occupied by them, but they left it in utter dis disarray. When we got into this camp, you pardon the expression, this was like a hellhole. It was grimy and filthy, no adequate. There was one faucet for, six, for several hundred people to wash up, no showers. It was awful. But we were there. We were out of the war zone. In this camp, within a month, a month and a half, over 100 people died because typhus had broken out. Inadequate hygienic facilities. Typhus broke out. This was on the beach. Sand, the barracks with undulated metal roofs. It was hot, and when it came down, it was sticky. We actually slept, slept during the night on the sand often because it's cooler and the barbed wire strung along the coastline. It's right by the Mediterranean, beautiful blue Mediterranean and the majestic Pyrenees mountains dropping, a sight to behold for a painter or for an artist. But we were there not painting, we were there fainting. And a lot of them did, and a lot of people died. I escaped from that camp with the help of a friend, and I have to tell you that. 
It was a friend whom I had met in Belgium. He was a Belgian Jewish boy who had fled Belgium to get out of the war zone like so many did on their own, on their own power. They took trains and cars and wagons and whatever to escape the war zone into southern France. And Leon was in Toulouse, a southern city, and he found out in the office of the Red Cross where the people were taken from Belgium, from Antwerp, into what camp? And he saw my name on that list. He got to this camp, went to the command post, and asked if he can visit me. They gave him a visiting permit. A guard came into the barracks, called my name, and says, Leo Bretholz, yes, what is it? He says, you have a visitor. I said, what? My gosh. He says, he's waiting for you at the barbed wire near the command post. Well, I went there, immediately ran there, and there was Leon. I said, what are you doing here? Said, how did you find? He told me how he found out, and he says, you know what? You can get away from here. How can I do it? He says, you know, I've been here a couple of hours. I've been checking this thing out. I've been talking to, to some of the guards here. You know, they don't even get near the barbed wire because they know there's typhus in there. If they get too close, they catch this thing too, you know. They're not guarding you because they, they know you're not criminals. You're just internees, civilian internees, so-called enemies, enemy aliens. He says, what do I do? He says, well, go back to the barracks, get your backpack, put on your shoes, because for about a month and a half, I didn't wear shoes on that sand. My soles were like leather, but this was good. This was nature. And he says, you come back here, and I'll help you get out of here. He says, oh, but it's dangerous. No, don't worry. They don't even pay attention. I got there. He said, all you do now is dig under the, under the barbed wire into the sand. Make yourself a little groove there, and then slide through, and I'll pull you out. And he did, and he dusted me off, and we walked away. And then he said to me, now you walk naturally. Don't run. Don't create any emotion, uh, emotion here. To do, don't, pay, don't draw attention. You don't want to draw attention to us. And as we walked away, he waved to the guards to whom he had just spoken. <laughs> and some of them waved back to him. So he says, Leo, we've made it. Let's just walk. And we walked away. And then I asked him, how about Annie and her family? This is my distant cousins with whom I had become emo a little bit... Um, fell in love, and he says, her family, they left Belgium too. They're now in the city of Luchon. I said, really? It's so close by, also in the Pyrenees. He says, you know what? I already have a train ticket for you, and you're going to go to Luchon to join the family. That's what Leon did for me. Some months later, a couple years later, he sent me a picture of him walking the streets of Marseille. And that was the last I heard of Leon. After the war, I tried to find him, probably was deported or whatever. Could never locate Leon again. But I escaped from that camp. And for the next years, until the end of the war, I spent in southern France. As you know from history, the French capitulated. You know what capitulating means, no? Yeah. Capitulate means when you give up. You stop fighting. You say, here I am, take me, I'm here. The French capitulated, gave up. And an armistice was signed between Germany and France. And it was decided that France will, def will be divided into two parts. The northern part, above the Loire River, which cuts France pretty much in two, and the coastline, the coastline is always strategic, that will be occupied by the Germans. The northern part, the Germans, with the headquarter in Paris, and the southern part of France would be administered by Marshal Philippe Pétain, who was the winner of the Battle of Verdun in the First World War, so the French trusted him as a patriot. He will not sell us out entirely. 
Here's what happened. Vichy France. Why was it called? Have, did you ever heard the term Vichy France before? Yes, I see that. Because the town of Vichy, it's a spa, like a vacation spot. The city of Vichy was the seat of government for Marshal Pétain. The French Vichy government didn't take them long to institute anti-Jewish laws. Again, when I said before, Germany, the nation of poets and thinkers, there is France, the nation that has given the world the Declaration of Human Rights, the Marseillaise, liberty, equality, fraternity, the nation of Victor Hugo and Voltaire and Emile Zola. That nation <coughs> joined the Germans in establishing anti-Jewish laws that were so stringent, so severe, that often the German high command from Paris had to admonish Marshal Pétain, don't go so far with your laws against the Jews because you're giving us a bad name. But the Vichy French did. To come back to Friday, do you know when the armistice was signed in northern France? Friday, June the 21st. So here we go again. I spent the rest of my years of running in southern France, and the anti-Jewish laws soon decreed that many of us, Jewish refugees from the north, or even French men, French Jews, born in France, had to go to what they called Residence Assignée. We were taken by train to a Residence Assignée, which means an assigned residence. We called it forced residence because we were sent there into those little villages near the Spanish border. We had no right to leave. We had to register with the police every week. And we were trapped between a rock and a hard place. Spain, we couldn't go in, barbed wire. We had no right to leave. We were sent into this forced residence. And this was with a purpose, so that when the deportations would begin, they would have us right where they wanted us to, ready for the plucking, taking us. You know the term deportation, don't you? Mm -hmm. Everybody knows that. When you're being sent away without your consent to a place that you don't know where, and, and why. The deportations of Jews from northern, in northern France in the occupied zone began in March of 1942, and in the Vichy zone, it started end of August of 1942. At that time, I found myself in a town called Cotere, near the Spanish border, had to register with the police every week, and the mayor of that town, a righteous Christian, there is a man who deserves my admiration, and he was later honored. The mayor of that town notified the Jewish population of that, of that village. It was, a, it was a, a village of, a little town of 1,200. All of a sudden, there are 1,000 Jews sent into this that they've never met before, never seen before in the Pyrenees. And we shared, it was a friendly atmosphere. That mayor sent a messenger into the village square to tell us, you have no right to leave, you have to register with the police. I tell you, do as you see fit. That was a courageous action. And some of us took to the mountains, the Pyrenees, and next day when we came down, of the thousand refugees that had been confined there, 500 had been arrested and deported to Auschwitz. There was no way for me to stay there any longer. And I made my way away from there to a town where I had lived before. I had a friend there. And this friend produced false papers for me. I had three sets of French papers. One was Meunier, the other one was Dumont, and the other one was Lefebvre. I became a Frenchman at three different, on three different occasions. And with a friend, Albert, with a friend, Albert, 
we made our way with false papers to the Swiss border. Mind you, I wore a beret. And with that beret and with a false card, I was a Frenchman, right? This was good because we traveled in the train, inspection, we, fine. It was October 1942, and there was a rhyme in the mountains. We climbed the mountains into, into Switzerland. Now, this could have been done by bicycle in 20 minutes across Lake Geneva, but we couldn't go the regular way. We had to go to the mountains. Again, we had a guide, another smuggler, who took us across the mountain path, and we looked down into Switzerland during the night, and there was rhyme and frost around us in the Alps in uh, late October. And we looked into Switzerland, and there was freedom at arm's reach. We could feel it. It was palpable. Switzerland. All we had to do is cross. The lights were reflected in Lake Geneva. Switzerland was neutral. There were no blackout. So the lights of Switzerland reflected in the lake. There, there was a blackout in France. There was a blackout in Belgium. There was war in Germany. There was blackout, civil defense. But Switzerland, lights on, and a beacon of freedom. What do you know about Switzerland, politically? Nothing. Nothing. Sorry. <laughs> how, how do they stand? On whose side are they on? Neutral, right? I hear neutral. Well, Switzerland's neutral. Then there are the beautiful things of Switzerland, right? Cheeses, <laughs> chocolates, watches, Omega, huh? Rolex, huh? Cuckoo clocks, the cute things, Edelweiss, all the Swiss, right? Don't let that fool you. There was a sergeant there in Switzerland at the police station because as soon as we crossed, we were arrested and taken to the village down to a police station. And there was a sergeant by the name of Aritas, the like of which you never want to meet. A sadist. We begged. We knelt. We held his hand. We wept. Please, take us to a camp. We want, I have a cousin here in a labor camp. Take me to that same labor camp. I want to survive the war. It's in Switzerland. Freedom, please. You're going back to France, he said. He took us across. This is a village called saint jean golf saint jean golf near the Lake of Geneva. Half of that village is French and half is Swiss. He took us from the Swiss side into the police station on the French side. And there we were, again, in the hands of the Vichy French who want to deport us. We were taken to a camp near the original Saint-Cyprien. That camp was called Rivesalt. We spent two weeks there. And then 109 of us, there was two and a half years had gone by. I had come basically full circle and made no progress. 109 of us were taken north. A couple of weeks later, to a camp near Paris in the northeast suburb of Paris called Drancy, D-R-A-N-C-Y. You may have seen that camp described at the Holocaust Museum. And Drancy we called the antechamber of Auschwitz because from Drancy in France, over 70,000 Jews were deported to Auschwitz, of whom only 2,000 survived. France, the nation of Victor Hugo and Voltaire and Emile Zola, doing what the Germans did, and perhaps even better. Seventy-some thousand people deported to Auschwitz. Two thousand survived, and this book, Le Memorial de la Déportation des Juifs de France, the memorial to the deportation of Jews from France, chronicles the events. In here, over 70,000 names. And my name is in here, too. Transport number 42 on the 6th of November, 1942, a Friday. I found myself in this deportation train, a thousand in the convoy, 20 cars, cattle cars, 
50 in each car. Of the, the 70,000, 2,000 survived, and those who have survived have next to their names a little dot. Young man, while you're here, see a little dot here? Yeah. There may be another, there's another one, right? You don't see many dots here. These dots designate those who have survived. <coughs> So if you have over 70,000 and 2,000 survived, you, have not, you haven't got many dots. There's a few dots here. See here another one. Some pages have none. Now here's the story. Why am I pointing this out? Transport number 42 of the 6th of November, 1942. My transport. See, young lady? I want you to join me with this, this way you can share. See transport number 42? See my name here? Leo Breitholz. See it, Leo, born in Vienna, 6th of March, 21, Vienna. I have no dot next to my name. What does that mean? I didn't survive. When I got this book into my hands, my wife was standing next to me, and I got a shiver running down my spine. And Flo looks at me and says, Leo, you look so pale. I said, no wonder I'm dead. <laughs> this, this was a shock to me, an emotional shock. I have no doubt here. I have not survived. And again, I have to say this, please keep in mind, the 20th century, the 20th century. Young lady, can you read this date here, loud? 1849. 1849. Look how meticulously, bureaucratically this was all arranged. Everything by date, chronicled. This person was a woman 94 years old, deported to Auschwitz. Here are children put into a cattle car on the same day that they came out of the womb into a cattle car, often without the mother. France, the 20th century. It's all recorded here. You know, we have a man in Iran who says the Holocaust didn't happen. Well, I would like to send them this book and say, Mr. Ahmadinejad, I think the Germans had nothing better to do than invent names, you know. They had a war to fight, but as a hobby, they just invented some names. It never happened. Got you. Here we are. My friend and I escaped from that train. We pried the bars apart with, with a wet sweater because when you have a wet cloth it's tensile in strength and you can twist and twist and twist. I want you to know that. I want to show your movie. Okay. Better listen to him. If not, he'll never have me again. <laughs> he will. We escaped from that train on the night of the 6th of November. And I want you to know, when we escaped from that train, we found new life. Because out of that train, only five survived. The other 72 hours later were murdered at Auschwitz. In the middle of each cattle car, there was a bucket you know what that was for, for 50 people. And I'll leave it to your imagination for how long that bucket served its purpose for 50 people. It was soon, it wasn't long before we were sitting and squatting and arguing the whole gamut of emotions, consoling and kids crying in human waste. And as we prepared to escape, some people tried to talk us out of it, but there was a woman in the, in the depth of the car. On crutches, she had lost a leg to amputation. And she pointed one of the crutches at us and said, don't let anybody talk you out of this. Do it, because if you succeed, you will tell the story. 
And then she added, que Dieu vous garde, may God watch over you. As I'm speaking to you, her eyes is right, are right in front of me. Just like my mother urged me to leave for freedom. This woman became, again, my mother and the mother of all of us. Don't let anybody talk you out of it. She emboldened us and we escaped. And the next night we spent with a priest in a priest's house. A baker's apprentice took us there. And he took us to the priest's sacristy and the reverend opened the door and the baker's apprentice immediately disappeared. We had asked him to show us where the priest lives. You know, this fellow didn't want to have any further involvement with us because he thought that was dangerous. Naturally, at night, two fellows speaking French with an accent, asking for a priest, something isn't quite kosher, right? <laughs> so he didn't want to, he doesn't need more involvement. He disappeared, but the priest was there, fellows, he said, what can I do for you? I said, well, we escaped from a train just a few hours ago. He says, oh, they come by here three times a week. You did escape from that train. Well, why don't you come in? But you know what? We smelled the high heaven, you know, from that putrid cattle car with human waste. We couldn't stand our own condition. We knew what. He said, fellas, before we talk, why don't you just go to the bathroom, use some soap and water, clean up a little bit, and then we'll talk. Now, when we came out, there was a point of light. There was a pot of milk warming for us on his stove. And on the table, a bread was sliced and some cheese and apples. He had prepared that for us while we were in the bathroom. Then we sat down and talked and he let us stay for the night. We came out of this cattle car, that putrid condition, and he put us into a feather bed, a down comforter, white crisp sheet. We didn't deserve that. We felt that's the place where we would like to spend the rest of the war, you know. But in the morning between five and six, he woke us. It's time to get up because you have to leave here before the patrols come by here. This is war zone. The Germans are in control. They come by here every day to inspect, ostensibly uh, to have a chat or maybe have a cup of coffee, a glass of wine. But they're looking around. They want to know what's going on. And they don't like us either because the Germans don't like Hitler was a, didn't like the clergy either. He woke us, gave us breakfast, and a recommendation, a letter with a recommendation to another priest some 30 or 40, 40 kilometers away. We hitched a ride there. We got there that evening, and that priest let us stay there, two Jewish fellows, in a barn, not in a barn, in a stable. He had a sacristy across from a small cemetery. There was a, a little farm he had and a stable. In that stable, there were two cows. And he took fresh straw, put it between the two cows, and bedded us out. And we felt like in seventh heaven. Have you ever tried to sleep between two cows? <laughs> it's warm, it's cozy, you feel sheltered. Who would look for two Jewish fellows between two cows anyway? <laughs> in a stable, right? But there we were, and we fell asleep immediately. The cows chewing the cud lulled us to sleep. And you know then, is the, pardon the expression, the manure. When I took, when me, my wife and I took our kids to the country, sometimes took for a ride and we went by farms and the kids said, oh, it closed the window, that stinks them. No, no, it doesn't. To me, it brings back sweet memories because I felt so good during that night, sheltered, safe, secure. To me, this is not manure, this is more like Chanel 66 or something. <laughs> That priest next morning handed us a ticket, I'm sorry, an envelope with two train tickets to Paris. There was something going on networking. We didn't ask questions. You don't ask questions and you wouldn't get an answer either where that came from. That's dangerous to know too much. But we arrived in Paris. I had an aunt hiding out there and she wanted us to stay in Paris. I didn't want to stay in Paris because in Paris, the Jews had to wear this star. Juif, Jew. In the southern zone, in the Vichy zone, this was not ordained. Simply, they wanted to still be different from the Germans. This is the original star that's now 60 some years old. And I told my aunt, no, I don't, I'm not going to stay in Paris because this is where I would have to wear the star and walk the streets. If you don't wear it, you can get shot on the spot. 
my friend and I cross back into the Vichy zone, he to rejoin a brother, and I to rejoin my girlfriend and uh, friendly family, and I was arrested in southern France. Arrested in southern France, they found out that I was the one that had escaped from the town that I had no right to leave. The mayor had informed us. You, you, you abandoned your assigned residence, and I was sent to prison and sentenced to one year in prison for abandoning my assigned residence. That was the Vichy, laws, Vichy, Vichy uh, government law. I was sentenced to prison for one year, and when you get one year in prison, you get a quarter of that year, three months off automatically for good behavior. So I'm supposed to serve nine months. After my trial, after my trial, I asked the police if they would allow me to go to the bathroom. They said, of course. And I went to the bathroom, and young man, that bathroom had a window. Why are you laughing? Go through the window. I get to the window. <laughs> Good guess. I escaped, and I had fooled the police. And it was a rainy day in January of 1943, and I said to myself, I'm in trouble. If I get caught again, I fooled the police. I have to pay the price. A, a day later, I was arrested, <laughs> sent to a police station, and they took me back to the town where the police had come that escorted me, and they beat me up something awful with a stoking iron from a fireplace, my legs, you got fast legs, right? bang, 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 my back, everything. Took me back to prison, and in prison I was beaten up by the, by the guards because I had lied, I had uh, run away, they had, they had their way with me. I was put into solitary confinement in prison for a full month, being in one cell all by myself with a slab of bread that was like, like loam or something, and something that they called tea, but didn't taste like tea. That's all I got for a whole month every day. I was beaten, and I served my nine months in prison, plus two days, because the two days were added that I was absent. I'll soon be finished. I was freed from prison nine months later, and sent to a hard labor camp for a month, Spent a month in that camp called Setfon, and one day the guard comes in and reads out 14 names. My name was among it. You are going to build fortifications. We are taking you to build fortifications on the West Coast, because the Germans were building them uh, towards the eventual landing that they expected. They wanted to fortify it. War time. Now, I don't look like someone who can build fortifications, right? I have a hernia that comes back to haunt me and that, was, that never gets better. Now, if I am supposed to carry 50-pound cement sacks and push wheelbarrows, and I collapse, I can't do the work, I'm no good to them. They can either shoot me or will just send me back to Drancy. So what did I do? I escaped from that train. <laughs> this time, it was a standing train in the train station of Toulouse. I had been familiar with the train station of Toulouse. I've been there several times. So I went through the package department and made my, I made out like I was looking for my luggage. And the fellow says, what are you looking for? My luggage. He says, you have the ticket. I said, well, not yet. He says, well, it'll be here soon. In the meantime, I walked out into the street. Here I was. And two weeks later, I joined with the French underground. The friend with whom I escaped the train originally had given me his address, the address of his brother. I committed it to memory because we couldn't write down anything. And after I escaped, I got in touch with him, and he sent me a birth certificate, and I became Max-Henri Lefebvre, another Frenchman. And with that documentation, I joined with the French underground, and I was assigned to, a city of, to the city of Limoges in south-central France. And on May the 8th, 1944, almost exactly four years after I, I didn't have my operation, I collapsed in the streets of Limoges with a ruptured hernia. I told you that will come back to haunt me. But also brings on one of the most tender and elevating moments in my years of running. A woman walked up. I was laying, lying on a park bench, violently ill. She said, young man, you had too much wine. You drank too much. That's why you... 
No, I said, no, I have a hernia and I cannot manage to push it back again. This bulge comes out, it's very hurtful. She says, you need a hospital. Just like I had nothing to say with my mother, I had nothing to say with that woman. Now, I am a Jewish fellow. I have false papers. I'm going to go under the knife by someone who doesn't, whom I don't know, a stranger. Maybe, will I come out alive for that? I didn't feel like going to the hospital, but it was necessary. The next day, the surgeon told me, if this woman hadn't called the ambulance, you would not be alive today because hernia, a ruptured hernia in 20 minutes turns into blood, blood poisoning. The next morning, I awoke in the hospital bed and a voice whispers into my ear, listen to this, a voice whispers into my ear, as long as I am in this ward, you have nothing to fear. Words like this I haven't heard in years, nothing to fear. And the voice added, I am your nurse. My name is Sister Jeanne d'Arc, Sister Joan of Arc, a religious sister, a nun who, in the Catholic hospitals in France, which mostly are, most hospitals are, most hospitals in France are Catholic hospitals, she is a nurse. You have nothing to fear, she said to me. And as I'm writing my memoir and choking up and getting all emotional, my wife said, you're not giving up now, are you? I said, well, I have a good mind to give up because I'm not torturing myself. Write to that hospital, she said, and find out if they know what happened to Sister Jeanne d'Arc. That was 54 years later. And I wrote, and the hospital told me, yes, she was with us till 1965. The last address we know is the house of Saint Joseph, Maison Saint Joseph, the house of Saint Joseph in the city of Castres. She is in a retreat, in a retreat for aging nuns. And I wrote to her and got an answer, and I had written to her, I can never forget your dark eyes, your beautiful eyes that gave me solace and comfort and help. And she wrote to me, dear Leo, don't, don't romanticize this because I'm now an old nun. <laughs> and in 1999, my wife and I visited her, and this is the picture of our visit in 1999. And then in 2004, Deborah Wiener of WBAL, who created a DVD, The Survivors Among Us, a documentary, took me in 2004 to France as part of the documentary to visit Sister Jeanne d'Arc. And this was some encounter, Sister Jeanne d'Arc. Right, and this is my treat to Leo. We're going to play it. For years, Leo would reflect on Sister Jeanne d'Arc and the most genuine act of kindness he experienced during the war, the nun so aptly named after Joan of Arc, who told him he was safe. How could she remember me? Impossible. She dealt with hundreds, if not thousands, of patients during her tenure as a nurse in Catholic hospitals. Sixty years later, Jeanne d'Arc remembers. Her life is now behind these walls at a retreat for aging nuns in southern France. In October, we reunited Leo with her again, and the other nuns at Maison Saint Joseph are simply giddy when he arrives. <laughs> it is a breezy fall day, and soon Leo spots Sister Jeanne d'Arc around the corner in a wheelchair. She is 93. The other nuns watch, and Leo's wife Flo, who first encouraged him to find Jeanne d'Arc, hugs her like family. It is hard not to reach out to this woman. And the monsieur, lui, c'est Charles. Charles. Hello. Everybody in this place knows that I'm coming. The doctor and all the other people and the social workers, everybody knows that she is the star. More nuns arrive and Leo explains their relationship. Mais vous êtes un ange. She was an angel from above. 
Unbelievable. Incroyable. Incroyable. They speak Merci. French and share photos. And Leo shows her the Jewish star that he had to wear during the war. Vous connaissez l'histoire, j'étais à Drancy. They remember the hospital where they met during the war. And Jean d'Arc mimics the way the Germans would question the doctors. Comment ça se fait que cet homme n'est pas opéré? Soon they moved outside to a courtyard, an 84-year-old man helping the 93-year-old nun. Voilà. Voilà. There are so many questions for this woman. Did she feel she was risking her life? She never thought of that. It never entered her mind. I ask her, what motivated you? She says, about your religion, I only know good and great and grandiose things. And she says, I knew I had to help you. And now I ask her, so at that moment, you knew that I was a Jew? She says, yes, I knew. For Leo, this woman is maternal. And for her... Qu'est-ce que moi je suis pour vous? Mon madame. Mon? Mon madame. I'm her patient. <laughs> These two laugh a lot. She says, when you see me, do you see me as the young sister that I was then? <laughs> is she something? Is she something? <laughs> You make us laugh. Leo, a youthful person, seems even younger during this encounter. Her eyes express warmth and gentleness, compassion, and love. The retreat then took us all in, serving us supper with Jean d'Arc at the head of the table. Just when it, uh, just as a it's just an after, quick, uh, just a brief afterthought. Okay. Who's got a Kleenex? Uh, I, that's all right. That's all right. That's all right. It's, it's emotional. Uh, yes. Where's, where's, where's my star? Hmm? Where's the star? Twan's got it upstairs. The star? She's showing upstairs. Oh, she's showing it upstairs. It's interesting. Sister Jeanne d'Arc. When we visited Sister Jeanne d'Arc the first time in 99, it's interesting. She had a great sense of humor. I had a car, a rental car, and one of the nuns asked me, where do you leave a car? I said, outside. She said, it's a steep street. Don't leave it there because these motorcyclists, they come back and damage your car. Bring it into our yard, into the retreat. Well, that yard is a beautiful garden. And then the nun, Sister Gabrielle, she led me to a place, a parking place, and they said, you park here almost like a parking lot attendant. Here, line it up here. And then I got out of the car, and I see to the right of my car is a statuette of Mary. Mary the Queen, with flowers around it. I said to the nun, you know, my car is very safe here, in good hands. She turned around, looked around, she didn't want to be overheard, and she whispered to me, lock it up anyway. <laughs> <laughs> then, when I, when I came to Sister Jeanne d'Arc and told her that, she says, you know, we have to have a sense of humor. This is very austere, but we try to have a sense of humor. And then one point I want to make, the day that she whispered these comforting words into my ears, you have nothing to fear, was May the 10th. May the 9th, 1944, almost to the day after I was going to have my first operation. May the 9th, 1944. You wouldn't believe it, or you can read into it what you will. The good sister died in 06. She had a stroke and passed away, almost 95 years of age. She was buried on May the 9th, the same day that she whispered these words into my ear. And with that, I want to thank you for coming and sharing and listening. And I'm ready for questions if you're ready to ask them. Thank you very much. Have a good Easter holiday. <laughs>